The IKF mass destruction event marked the end of an era in North American kickboxing. Taking place at the Songas Arena in Lowell, Massachusetts on May 14, 1999, it was a kind of show that otherwise didn't make it to pay-per-view at the height of the K-1 era, even in the U.S. The matches were mostly under full contact rules, the majority of fighters had been active since at least the 80s, and the presentation was staunchly North American, with longtime commentator Phil Stone on the microphone and John Eve Terrio providing color analysis. This was a nostalgia show, catering to people who didn't enjoy the current style of Japanese kickboxing, or just missed the flavor of yesteryear. There wasn't a single throwaway bout on the card, every single one of the matches being a championship showdown, so it's all the more disappointing that two of the six fights were cut, not only from the original presentation, but also from the video release. I was able to locate incomplete footage of one of them, but to the best of my knowledge, there's no readily available video of the Kelly Morse and Christina Rondeau contest for the IKF US Women's Super Lightweight title. Morse won by split decision after six rounds, in a match that was originally scheduled for 10 before being shortened due to the anticipation of pay-per-view runtime problems. It's disappointing when something so arbitrary has an effect on what's preserved for posterity, but in this case, it's likely that the producers wanted to be better safe than sorry. Only the previous year, the Draka 5 pay-per-view actually ended mid-show, in the middle of the night's most exciting match, because the production simply ran out of time. Well, this has been a great night of Draka fighting. For Blinky Rodriguez, I'm Phil Stone, saying so sorry to have to leave you with one round to go. Good night, everybody. The first match of the night is also the first match to have been cut. Tom Kimber vs. Curtis Bush for the inaugural IKF World Middleweight Championship. Kimber stands 6 feet tall, weighs 163 pounds and holds a record of 15 and 1. Not much information is readily available on Kimber, other than that he's the younger brother of fellow kickboxer Dick Kimber, appearing later on the card. Bush stands 6 feet tall, weighs 164.5 pounds, and has a kickboxing record of 42, 8 and 2. Unlike Kimber, there is plenty of information available on Bush, who is one of the all-time best US welter and middleweights. He never broke into low kick competition, choosing to stick to his strengths and winning five world titles in the process. He's also balanced this with a pro boxing career, becoming one of relatively few kickboxers to excel in the sweet science. The footage I have access to is incomplete, so I'm referring to the IKF website for a summary of the match. After several rounds of back-and-forth action, Bush apparently aggravates a back injury and begins to suffer from muscle spasms that greatly affect his mobility. Kimber takes full advantage, moving in with little difficulty and scoring two knockdowns over his opponent. Bush stuck it out and went the distance, but lost in a blowout decision, two judges scoring the bout 100-85 and another 100-86. Kimber as the new champion. This match illustrated the flip side of nostalgia. Curtis Bush is a legend who's earned his accolades, but it's difficult to imagine the Bush of 1985 or even 95 being rendered so incapacitated during a match of this magnitude. At age 37, he's not the same fighter he used to be, and he seems to recognize this. After the match, he announced his retirement from kickboxing. The following month, he fought his pro boxing retirement bout, ending his competitive career entirely. This actually sets forth a trend for retirement bouts on the show, and in a way, Bush's departure is the saddest. He gave the viewers in attendance everything he had, but it's disappointing that his final time in a kickboxing ring was among his worst. Kimber held onto his belt about two years, after which he became the first IKF champion to lose his title. Following the missing Morse Rondeau match, it's time for the Battle of the Giants, as Mike Labrie fights Kevin Rosier for the inaugural IKF World Super Heavyweight Championship. Labrie is 6 foot 4, 230 pounds, and has a 46 and 2 record. 
stories of Labrie's legendary toughness abound. The former ISKA and Kick World Champion apparently won a match during which he suffered a broken thumb and fractured sternum, so it's difficult to argue with his credentials. His most famous bout was a one-sided loss to Andy Hoog under K-1 rules, but he's more in his element here, where the key factors will be strength and stubbornness. Rosier is also 6 foot 4, but at 275 pounds, he is a whopping 45 pounds heavier than his opponent. His record is 56 and 8. Win or lose, I believe this has already been announced as Rosier's final kickboxing match, the first prong of a long and illustrious career in combat sports coming to an end. Kevin is also a professional boxer, and is probably best known for reaching the semi-finals of the very first UFC tournament, but he's also been world kickboxing champion at least five times since 1989. If the IKF's hype is to be believed, this match has been several years in the making, and at the time, the fighters are the two highest-ranked super heavyweights in the company. They will have 12 rounds lasting two minutes each to determine who truly is the top brawler. Round 1. Labrie gets in the first major strikes with big haymakers in the corner, but Rosier pushes out and puts him on the defensive with punches. Rosier ends up back in the corner but covers up. Rosier lands a straight left to the head of Labrie, who by now has chosen to focus on Rosier's midsection. Round 2. Rosier goes to his knees from an obvious punch to the groin, but the referee erroneously calls it a knockdown and delivers an 8 count. Labrie puts Rosier on the defensive with an overhand right and penetrates his defenses with several straight punches. Kevin attempts to return fire, but Labrie maintains the pressure and has definitely landed more strikes by the time the round ends. Round 3. Rosier finds himself back in the corner immediately, taking punches, and this is later followed by another hard right. Kevin finally manages to retaliate with some hard strikes to the face. The fighters exchange huge blows now, and acknowledge each other's strength. Labrie succeeds in keeping the heavier Rosier off him with front kicks, but Kevin continues to have his best round of the match with numerous blows to the face. At one point, he confidently drops his gloves and urges Labrie to hit him. Round 4. The boxers jockey for the upper hand, neither really getting it until Labrie backs Rosier into the corner again. He begins to fight backing up, not coming forward until catching Rosier under his defenses. Both fighters are breathing with wide open mouths by the time the round is over. They're expending a lot of energy, probably more than can be maintained for a full 12 rounds, but neither wants to be the one to slow down first. Round 5. Labrie lands kicks to the midsection of Rosier, who retaliates with a missed roundhouse kick and a straight right punch which lands. He throws some big, swinging strikes, but Labrie is able to absorb them well. Again, Rosier is back in the corner, after which Labrie returns to the counter-fighting style. He delivers many strikes to his opponent's abdomen before the bell rings. Round 6. Rosier lunges forward with a front kick, but Labrie avoids most of it. Labrie begins fighting with more combinations than before, relying less on single strikes. Rosier is definitely holding back now, standing against the ropes for long periods and absorbing body punches. Labrie lands a second low blow on Rosier, and this time the referee notices it but doesn't seem to deliver a warning. A somewhat understandable oversight since Labrie accidentally hits him during the separation. This leads to yet another low blow to Kevin, who's finally given adequate time to recover. With six of the 12 rounds fought, this seems to be turning into Mike Labrie's fight. Low blows aside, he's simply been the more active and accurate fighter. Neither boxer is very technical, but Labrie has been able to rack up points with a lot of unprotected shots while his opponent regroups. Even though both boxers prefer to fight in bursts, Rosier can't match Labrie's pace. The shots below the belt may have had something to do with that, but nevertheless, it's now up to Kevin to reclaim the match. 
Additionally, it needs be noted that Rosier missed the minimum kick requirement in round 3. It's not clear if he's received a warning or has already been penalized, but either way, he needs to remain conscious of this. He wouldn't be the first fighter to lose a match purely on missed kicks. Round 7. Labrie is backing up again, throwing kicks as he goes. He breaks through Rosier's defense with an uppercut and some hooks, then finally seems to stun Kevin with a body shot. Both fighters are tired now, leaning on each other to the point of separation. Kevin lands some strikes to Labrie's face, but he doesn't seem to have enough power left to do much damage. Round 8. More kicks from Labrie as Rosier is forced yet again into the corner. Rosier is having difficulty closing the distance as he comes forward. He fails to keep Labrie in the corner, Mike punching out aggressively. A front kick to the abdomen sends Rosier to the canvas for the first legitimate knockdown of the match, showing that the body strikes have definitely taken their toll. Rosier goes down again as the round ends, but it appears to have been the result of a thumb to the eye and is not counted as a knockdown. Round 9. Kevin Rosier is running dangerously low on stamina. He's still able to land some strikes, but nothing as powerful as Labrie's. He puts everything he has into some big haymakers in the round's second half, but Labrie is able to just back away. Body blows hurt Rosier to the point of a standing eight count, leaving him gasping for air. Labrie is also visibly tired, but it's nothing compared to Rosier's exhaustion. Things are not looking good for the retiring fighter. Round 10. Rosier's big move of the round is a charging front kick which Mike avoids. It briefly seems as though the bigger man has rallied, but then, a couple of moments later, it's over. Rosier momentarily stuns Labrie with a left hook to the side of the head, then walks into a countering straight left to the chin that sends him to his knees. The referee opts to end the bout when it's clear he can no longer safely fight. Mike Labrie wins the match by stoppage and is the new champion. This match was anything but graceful, but it's exciting thanks to the large number of head strikes. The action was faster than most people likely expected, and for someone fighting the last match of his kickboxing career, Kevin Rosier showed a lot of heart. That said, the sheer amount of low blows he suffered feels like an indignity. They likely weren't intentional, along with the thumb to the eye, but a fighter of Mike Labrie's experience shouldn't have let that keep happening, and the referee should have been more observant and responsive. Nevertheless, even when taking these things into account, Rosier still wasn't at his best. Stamina was a problem for Kevin even during his heyday, and he missed the minimum number of kicks in a total of four rounds. It's unclear why this didn't lead to a disqualification. However, in the end, I am glad that the match was able to play out in its entirety, and that Kevin Rosier was able to display his tremendous toughness one more time. He would retire from boxing and MMA by early 2001. Tragically, he died in 2015, apparently of a heart attack. Labrie was champion for a little under two years, retiring the belt when he himself retired in 2001. However, he returned to the ring in 2007, and in 2012, he became world champion again at age 51. If anyone needs additional confirmation of what a full-blooded fighter he is, he apparently made his MMA debut in an unsanctioned match two years later, at age 53. It would hardly come as a surprise if he was preparing for another fight at the time of this posting. While the IKF decided to make the upcoming Don Wilson match the promotional highlight of this event, arguably the most anticipated bout of the night is the contest for the inaugural IKF World International Rules Heavyweight Championship between Rick Rufus and Stan Longinidis. Rufus, 5 foot 11 and 215 pounds, with a record of 50 and 5, is without a doubt the most successful American kickboxer of the 1990s. He's spent the decade being practically undefeatable under his favored full contact rules, winning five world titles in addition to the two he held during the 80s, 
and racking up wins over some of the biggest names in the game, including Ernesto Hust and Rob Kaman. Opposite of him is Stan Longinidis, standing 5'10 and weighing 213 pounds with a 48, 6 and 3 record. Longinidis is another icon of the decade, single-handedly placing Australia on the map as an exporter of world champions, having won six world titles since 1990. He's defeated the likes of Bronco Sikatish, Adam Watt and Musashi, but is best known for breaking the leg and reputation of Denis Alexio in 1992, thereby cementing himself as one of the most famous low-kick fighters of all time. Despite their accolades, both fighters have struggled to make their mark in the new world of kickboxing. Rufus and Longinidis have competed several times in K1, but even though Rick became the first US tournament champion and Stan made it to the World Grand Prix in Tokyo, neither have fared particularly well against the latest crop of the world's best. Nevertheless, their showdown here is a dream match in classic kickboxing. The fight probably would have drawn comparable levels of excitement at any time during the last seven years. On paper, the international rules favor Longinidis, who's won most of his world titles under low-kick stipulations, whereas Rufus has struggled with leg kicks ever since his legendary showdown with Changpuk Kiyosongrit in 1988. However, Stan bears the major disadvantage of a weak knee, having undergone complete reconstruction of the joint two years prior. It would be to his advantage if this fight didn't go the full scheduled 12 rounds. Round 1. The fighters measure each other for much of the round, not throwing much. A few kicks and punches, but both defend themselves too well for either to land anything. Round 2. Longinidas goes for a low kick and hook combo, but only connects with the former, and Rufus comes back with a jump spinning back kick. Rufus then throws an axe kick, but Longinidas jams it with his shoulder and causes a slip. The fighters try to mix it up, but they're both so fast with such good head movement that, again, nobody lands much of anything beyond low kicks. Round 3. Rufus starts the round with reddened legs, but shows no ill effects as he controls the distance with side kicks. Longinidas causes a slip with a right low kick as Rufus attempts a Brazilian kick. Rufus then switches tactics and begins aiming for Stan's left leg. He also lands a left mid kick. Longinidas avoids a spinning back fist, but Rufus manages another low kick and then a head kick within the final 10 seconds. The pace of the match had previously favored Longinidas, but Rufus appears to be coming back and building up points. Rick is utilizing his characteristic nimbleness to avoid the stronger but slower Stan's power strikes while sinking his own. Round 4. A low kick from Longinidas lands, but Rufus has officially warmed up and is using the entire ring to fight, moving laterally whenever he can. Left low kicks from both fighters connect. A high kick from Rufus lands without much power, and Stan lands an accidental low blow. Round 5. Longinidas grabs Rick's leg, but Rufus keeps his balance. Nevertheless, Rufus is beginning to feel the sting of those low kicks, and he's clearly in pain when struck. But all of the sudden, Rick scores a knockdown with a high roundhouse kick. Longinidas gets back up quickly and tries to counter fight, but he's wobbly on his legs and slips, killing his own momentum. Rufus ends the round by focusing on low kicks while covering up against Stan's punches. This was clearly the best round so far for Rick Rufus, and the bout is clearly in his favor now. Round 6. Low kicks continue to be exchanged, and for the first time, it looks as though they're hurting Longinidas, specifically in his left leg. A kick-punch combo to Stan's head hurts him, and Rick keeps darting in and out with even more kicks to the legs. There's a slip, but Rufus continues to avoid most of what Longinidas throws at him. This is quickly turning into the best demonstration of low kicks that Rick Rufus has ever given. He's trained exceedingly well for this match and seems to be beating Stan Longinidas at his own game. Round 7. 
Rufus almost lands another high kick, then throws a spinning back kick just for flash. Stan barely misses a spinning back fist but lands a follow-up low kick. A low kick by Rufus doesn't land, but another back kick does. Rufus the counterfighter seems thoroughly comfortable, returning a low kick by spinning around with another back kick. Round 8. An accidental low blow from Rufus. Rick seems to land some head strikes as Longinitas comes in low. Stan blocks two high kicks, but continues to have difficulty effectively closing the distance. Rufus is still full of energy, showing good head movement and continuing to kick below the waist. In the closing seconds, he throws a high kick which, while blocked, knocks Longinitas backwards. Round 9. A head kick lands, and so does a front kick to Stan's face. Rick gets him against the ropes and wears him down, landing uppercuts. Longinitas is so exhausted by now that he's having difficulty connecting with even his own low kicks. A hook to the head sends him staggering against the ropes. More uppercuts, and Longinitas is given a standing 8 count. The round ends, and as it turns out, that's the end of the fight, with the ringside doctor ruling a stoppage before round 10. Stan Longinitas has suffered an injury to his foot or ankle, and Rick Rufus claims another world championship for his collection. As disappointing as it can be for a fight to end on a stoppage, this was hardly an underwhelming match. Both fighters fought as hard as they could, but in the end, Rick Rufus came out on top. It's gratifying to see him finally master what was once a major weakness, taking the fight to an opponent for whom this is supposed to be a strong suit. Stan Longinitas gave us everything he had, but there's little arguing with broken bones. It would have been interesting to see this same fight take place a few years earlier, before his leg became a weak point, but as is, there's no denying the outcome. I believe this match was the last world title contest for either fighter. Longinitas returned to K1 and enjoyed a few more victories, but he retired for good after 2003 and nowadays operates a gym and works as a motivational speaker. Rufus was active for over another decade, fighting mostly for K1 and reaching the finals of a couple tournaments. He fought at least one more of these delayed dream matchups, when he defeated fellow US legend Maurice Smith in 2003 by unanimous decision. It seems he finally retired in 2012. After having accomplished just about everything he could to establish himself as one of the greatest of all time, he's unlikely to ever be forgotten. It's time for the marquee matchup. Don Wilson comes out of retirement to fight Dick Kimber for the IKF World Cruiserweight Championship. The legendary Wilson is 6 feet tall, 190 pounds and arrives with a record of 69, 5 and 2, with 10 world titles already to his name. Wilson effectively retired in 1991 to focus on his acting career, but the fact that he was a competitive fighter never seemed secondary to his movie stardom and a lot of people expected him to make a comeback sooner or later. Dick Kimber is a local fighter who nevertheless has already won three world titles of his own. At 5 foot 9, he gives up 3 inches to Wilson in height, but has a slight weight advantage at 193 pounds, and he boasts a 23-2 record. Kimber's most famous match to date was a 1994 loss to Dennis Alexio, but he's gained some valuable experience since then to take on another legend. Also, I don't know how old Kimber is, but the age difference between him and the 44-year-old Wilson could easily factor into the match. On the other hand, Kimber apparently dropped a good deal of weight, which could also make a difference in the battle ahead. A bit of trivia. Though Wilson is clearly the movie star, Dick Kimber has had a small acting career of his own. Four years ago, he'd filmed a fight scene with the legendary Joe Lewis for the Godfrey Ho film, Mr. X. Round 1. Wilson immediately begins controlling the distance with his signature sidekick, but isn't afraid to mix it up on the inside. Kimber tries darting in, but to no avail. They both kick at the same time and Wilson is knocked off balance. Kimber's aggression pays off when he lands an overhand, 
a couple of uppercuts and a straight left, but he's then knocked backwards by a sidekick and barely blocks a follow-up strike. Round 2. Wilson lands some sidekicks but is knocked off balance against the ropes. He easily avoids Kimber's spinning heel kicks, which seem to be Dick's own signature move. He takes some uppercuts in a clinch which the referee is slow to break up, then goes to work with his own fists from the middle distance. This is an interesting round. Wilson doesn't look quite like the fighter he was nine years ago, but he's definitely doing more than going through the motions. Kimber is having difficulty finding an effective distance to fight with him. Round 3. Kimber tries to push in, but Wilson's leg is as effective a barrier as ever. Kimber lands a spinning back fist, but it's not very hard, and Wilson retaliates with a kick to the sternum. Wilson earns a questionable knockdown with another sidekick. Kimber misses with another spinning back fist, but lands a third. Wilson then catches Kimber with a hook and capitalizes with several more punches. Dick falls to the canvas in the final seconds of the round. The match then ends in some confusion. Supposedly Kimber was counted out, but a miscommunication between the referee and an IKF official led to Kimber being told that he was clear to return to his corner. By the time the snafu is rectified and Wilson is declared the winner, both sides are already preparing for round four. Regardless, Wilson wins the match and becomes the new champion, starting his comeback off on the best possible foot. Don Wilson's kicking ability remains undiminished, as is his ability to take a punch and fight while on the move. This bout isn't up there with Wilson Terrio or Wilson Alexio as one of the Dragon's most exciting showdowns, but Wilson demonstrated that there's still something to be said for the power of nostalgia where he's concerned. While other fighters of his era are retiring, he's becoming world champion again. Two additional points of trivia. Don Wilson was paid $150,000 to compete. According to the IKF, this made him the highest paid kickboxer in history. Additionally, a furor arose in the show's aftermath, when journalist Russell Shawnee published a less than flattering review of the event, the most contentious claim of which was that Wilson's match was fixed. Apparently the writer received such universal backlash for his unfounded accusation that he was compelled to issue an apology. The final match of the night is a contest for the IKF World Welterweight Championship, with Paul Biafor taking on Bernard Robinson. Biafor is 5 foot 10, 146 pounds and comes in with a record of 28, 3 and 1. I don't know much about Biafor other than that he traded wins with Curtis Bush in the 1980s. Robinson is 5 foot 7, 147 pounds and arrives with a 43 and 5 record. Again, I don't know much about Robinson, other than that he also boxed professionally. It may have been a strategic decision to place this match after the Wilson-Kimber bout. Wilson was the main draw, but in the event that his match didn't deliver, it would be up to the welterweights to put on an electrifying fight and send the audience home happy. Luckily, this wasn't necessary, but Biafor and Robinson did so anyway. Round 1. The fight starts off swiftly with both boxers exchanging speedy kicks and punches, looking faster and crisper than anyone we've seen before now. The round is mostly an exhibition of defense, until the final 10 seconds, when Biafor lands a roundhouse kick to Robinson's head and follows up with a front kick against the ropes. Robinson may have been on his way to a knockdown, had the bell not rung. Round 2. Biafor keeps Robinson on the defensive, landing a roundhouse kick to the face but without a lot of power. The two exchange kicks, neither landing much with their legs, though Biafor gets some punches in after closing the distance. Round 3. 
Robinson catches some punches on the inside, but isn't able to retaliate with much. Biafor stalks his opponent, not letting him go anywhere but the corner, and lands a series of head kicks and punches that lead to a standing eight count. After three rounds, Paul Biafor is in firm control of this bout. It's been a contest of speed so far, and as nimble as Robinson is, Biafor has been the faster man. At this point, Robinson's best chance may be to slow his opponent down with damage to the body, but after already receiving so much punishment of his own, it's questionable whether he's up to the task. Round 4. Robinson throws possibly the flashiest technique of the night, a jump-spinning roundhouse kick that nevertheless misses its mark and leads to him getting a shoulder in the groin. A strong combo by Biafor lands flush. A spinning backfist opens Robinson to a series of kicks and punches in the corner, but somehow he's able to recover. Round 5. Robinson appears to have a cut or bruise next to his right eye as he returns to the fight. He avoids an inside hook kick but takes a few punches to the head. He goes for a jumping hook kick, but it doesn't land at all. A spinning back kick from Biafor does. Then, in the final 10 seconds, Biafor scores three roundhouse kicks to the head in quick succession, and Robinson goes down with the bell. Even though he makes it back to his feet, he's not fit to continue, and Paul Biafor wins by knockout. As far as heavily one-sided matches go, this one was nevertheless exciting, given how flashy both fighters are. There were a lot of very athletic kicks, all of the action was in high gear, and both boxers were able to show off. It made for a compelling bout to end the show. Robinson would continue to fight into the new millennium, eventually retiring from competition, and now seems to work as a physical trainer in Tennessee. In 2008, he set a Guinness World Record for the longest punching bag marathon, going 37.5 hours. Biafor had a few more matches ahead of him, but was never challenged for his title. He likewise retired from competition to focus on a music career in California. So concludes the IKF mass destruction event, possibly the last major show of old school western kickboxing. Is it as good as its promotion insists, claiming it was, in quotes, the greatest night in kickboxing? Probably not. That said, it's an undeniably fun show with some classic names in ultimately satisfying matches. As one of shockingly few kickboxing events to be given a legitimate video release in North America, it's worth a purchase. On a final note, the show ended in behind-the-scenes controversy, with most of the fighters not being paid their due for competing. According to IKF president Steve Fossum, this wasn't the fault of the International Kickboxing Federation, but of promoters and the State Athletic Commission failing to make good on what were supposed to be guaranteed purses. Apparently, Don Wilson had been paid in advance, but virtually every other fighter was either paid late, wasn't paid in full, or wasn't paid at all. This ranged from Christina Rondeau and Kelly Morse being out $2,000 and $1,000, respectively, to Stan Longinidis losing $35,000 and Rick Rufus a whopping $91,000. The VHS and DVD releases of the show were produced to help pay the fighters via commercial sales. It's unclear whether this debacle affected the production of future IKF shows.